What a treat. So I'm just going around this morning. Um, I'm just preparing the yards for the feeding crew. I'm just getting the colony set up, uh, taking off some of these excluders that we haven't taken off yet. Uh, you know, just assessing for uh, colony viability, calling out colonies. Um, I'm just preparing the yards so the feed crew can come through and drop pails. We have all the honey stripped off now. It's all sitting in the hot room. And I have the extracting crew working at that right now. Hopefully we'll get through it all. Um, by Friday, because Friday I lay most of my staff off, pretty much everybody is laid off except for Carrie. Uh, the university students mm -hmm. going back and the high school students going back to school, so I'm able to uh, drop the axe and purge the crew. So it actually worked out pretty well. As it does every year, I hire in the staff to help me through the summer to bring in this massive honey crop. And then about this time of year, we finish up, I can lay them off. And then it's just Carrie and I to finish up the last bit of the work through the season. And going through the colonies, these colonies are in terrific shape. So I'm extremely happy with that too. These colonies are building this very well-defined winter nest. She has three or four frames of active brood going on within these colonies. And that is just going to form this beautiful winter nest. 
And because of that, uh, she's got that nest pretty well defa defined right now. Um, and she's really slowed down in her laying. Uh, we're gonna focus on bulk feeding right now. We're maybe just a little bit early on that, but this nest has defined itself. I mean, this is what we got. We're gonna start into um, bulking these colonies up for winter. So as you can see, these colonies are full of bees. I've pushed everything down into that single chamber now. And I don't, not all my colonies look like this, but a lot of my colonies are bearding because there's a huge population within the, the uh, boxes right now. I get a lot of questions asking me about um, why I allow them to beard like this and why I don't provide space to house them. We have to realize the process that's going on here. Um, maybe a little bit of my process and a little bit of the hives process that's going on. So these colonies have built up these massive summer populations and they've been able to go out and collect this massive crop out in the fields and bring it in for me to capitalize on. Now the flows are pretty much done except for the minor fall flows that are going on out there. So their work is done. In the view, in my view, and in a lot of ways in the colony's view, uh, these bees are now expendable. They've done their job and they're, they're finished. These, these bees are expendable and they're going to die off within a couple of weeks. So I'll come back here in two weeks and they won't be bearding anymore because all these summer bees have gone off and died. But in the meantime, I'm going to put these, these bees to work. We're going to backfill this colony full of syrup. We're going to start that now. And then they're going to backfill around that brood nest that's going on inside. Right now, my focus is on the development of this winter nest. So she's got three or four frames of brood going on inside. We don't have to worry about that. The syrup inflow interferes with that. They're gonna bring the, the, the nectar, they're gonna bring in the pollen, they're gonna bring in the syrup that I provide for them, and they're gonna pack that around that brood nest. And as that queen slows down, like she's gonna really slow down her laying, uh, she'll pretty much stop as we head into November. But as that brood hatches out, uh, there's gonna be syrup here and they're gonna backfill that open space with syrup. And as this colony develops its winter nest, as it hatches out, and we're gonna backfill it, and we're gonna plug this box right full of syrup. So as that brood nest is developed, it matures, hatches out, we pack it full of uh, syrup for them to winter on. And we can do that because that queen right now, she's steadily slowing down. By taking advantage of the behavior of the bees this time of year, we're able to winter them very successfully in this single chamber. So this winter nest will hatch out and they'll fit very nice and snug within this single chamber.
I have a lot of yards that are on field edges or just in places where maybe it's not as appropriate to have the hives for accessibility and such as we move into fall, uh, potentially into some foul weather. So I'm just picking up these yards around the edges, um, bring them into places a little bit closer to home, uh, along the edges of the valleys and such. So there's lots of nutrition and shelter and just just in a place where we can access these hives a little easier as we bulk them up for winter. So basically I'm just picking up the yards on the field edge and just finding these nice little sheltered locations alongside the valley on our land. Crops off here so it gives me lots of space to work and just drop them off here. It's nice and calm. We have lots of forage into the in the ravines here and around the field edges and down the roadsides. It's a good place to put hives uh, throughout the fall and they're accessible so we can uh, we can really bulk these colonies up. Uh, they're, they're getting heavy, uh, they're not near heavy enough so we need a good part of September here to finish feeding up these colonies. Uh, another tanker of syrup come in this morning so now we can continue on and get these colonies right up to weight. And my goal is to get them fed up before October. October I want them basically fed up because we never, we're never sure what comes in October. October is kind of a roll of the dice. Um, it could come in nice, we could have a nice October and you know have lots of time to get these colonies fed up but uh, you know a dreaded snow could fall on us and it just completely stalls everything and the bees never really get a real good opportunity to pack away and properly cure all this feed. So we're working now through September just to plug these colonies right up as that nest hatches out uh, all the, the winter nest is pretty much done now. It's just a matter of that brood hatching out and as it does we're going to backfill it full of syrup and get these colonies, these, these fives, we're going to get up, up to about 50 to 55 pounds. The sixes in a little bit heavier, maybe 60. And then the singles, we're going to get them right up to 95, 90, 95, pushing 100 pounds a colony. So I'm just poking around one of my bee yards here. And I'll show you, I, I've, we've come through, and this is the second time we've fed this yard. And these guys are hot on that second pail, so they're going to suck this second pail right clean. And earlier, before we started feeding them, I went through and I called out any of the, uh, the hives that, you know, had queen issue. Or just didn't appear to be viable. You know, I do a pretty tough call in the fall here. So I'm counting, and... As you can see, there's quite a few blank spaces here. This is a yard of 40. And I've pulled out 10. So that's 25% uh, summer call from this yard. Which is a lot. That's kind of a lot. I'm typically running around around that 10, 12, maybe 15% call. Which is seems high, but you know, I've come to just kind of accept it as being custom. We, as beekeepers, we're always fighting attrition. We're fighting these, these hives. They always seem to be dying on us. They're never performing the way we want them to. You know, we're beekeepers, we're quite fussy. But I've, I've come to learn that in this business, we just kind of have to kind of accept loss and deal with it. So the strategy that I've uh, kind of uh, fallen back on is I found it a lot more productive to focus on the losses, get them out. You got to get them out of the yard. You can't be spending time or money on hives that are failing or have failed. And I've found that it's a lot more proactive just to shake them out instead of try to salvage them. Just shake them out and then replace them with nukes that are built in the spring. New, in the spring, spring is our high time. Spring is the time that we want to rear queens. That is, you know, end of May into June up here is probably the best period of time that we can actually mate these queens. There's lots of sexually mature, mature drones. Uh, the weather is a lot more predictable. We are producing fantastic queens. And by using those queens, we can establish these nice, neat little nukes. So we establish these nukes in the spring and we let them ride all the way through summer, maybe get a box or two of honey off them. 
and then come fall when we're taking this fall call all these empty spots that you're seeing here I'm gonna drop nukes into these spots and completely relieve the attrition that had happened throughout the summer so what's happened in these hives I don't know it's queen problems drone layers as old queens uh, a hive maybe swarmed and got caught up and didn't you know didn't retain the established colony uh, super seizures. Every time that queen goes through a queen replacement, there's a risk. There's a risk that that queen's not going to come back and mate or properly establish that colony again. I pull with escapes, so maybe I pulled some of these queens back with me because she got through the excluder. You know, there's a number of things that could have happened here. When I'm going through these losses, I'm checking for disease all the time. I, these, these, uh, all these calls, if there's any issues, we go through them with a fine tooth comb just to make sure there is no disease issue that actually led to the to the uh, the loss of that colony is very important. But once we establish the losses, we shake them out, we drop these nukes back in, and it just injects just that youth back into the operation that just helps uh, sustain momentum moving forward. So this, you know, I'm counting. There's no rhyme nor rhythm to it either. Like, so I've had. 25% loss in here. By the end of next week, hopefully I'll get the nukes dropped back into these empty spots and I'll just have 25% of my bee yard here injected with terrific youth. And they're gonna go into winter and come out and it's just gonna, you know, it just helps revive that loss. It just helps fight that continual attrition that we're always fighting. Just one of those strategies just to help me manage time for one thing workload and just making sure that the colony count that I have going into the flow here is the same colony count I have going into winter. So we're making the rounds today. Uh, we're hitting up the nuke yards. Uh, this has probably been the fourth or fifth time that we've uh, filled these pails on these nukes. So they're starting to get full, but they need a little bit more. Now these little pails are nice and convenient because they fit nice and neat and tight over top of these nukes. Uh, but you know, they're small, they're about a gallon. So we gotta make a, a few more rounds to build to to fill them up to be able to get the syrup down into them. So we're also setting out some open feed. Carrie's setting out a couple totes over there just to help uh, bring in more syrup a lot quicker here to bulk these colonies up uh, before October. October is kind of like my um, my benchmark. We've got to have these hives set up by October. 
you never know what kind of weather is coming in October. It could be mm -hmm. snowy, cold weather. These colonies will, you know, set up in a little tight winter cluster and they'll have trouble breaking cluster to take down the syrup and more importantly, cure it. So we always try to take advantage of the warm days that uh, sometimes September gives us to be able to end the amount of bees in these colonies. There's still summer bees in these colonies, so we're making use of this big population to be able to uh, take that syrup, cure it, and uh, store it away for winter. So we're on our second feed round. Um, we're in our second uh, semi-load of syrup. So they are bulking up, they're fill filling up, they're coming up to wait. Uh, next week and the week after that, we'll go around and top up anything that's a little bit light and carry forward from there. So you can see these guys are a little bit excited. Now we dropped some syrup into the yard and just kind of woke them up, uh, which is positive. These guys are hungry. They're ready to store food away for winter. I've gone through, I've done my mite wash in this yard and found one mite in the shake. So that's positive. There's not a lot there. And they're taking these pails down quite quickly, which is extremely reassuring. You always know when they're setting themselves up for winter that they're probably in pretty good shape. They certainly have a lot of activity in this yard. That little bit of syrup that dumped onto that cluster as we tipped the pail down uh, sure excited the nests. So they are woke up and they are ready to take on the day. So I'm digging into a yard that is still brood rearing. These guys have open brood. They're looking all right. One of my bee yards that's on the edge of the apiary. So I have neighboring beekeepers that way and a neighboring beekeepers that way. About two miles away, I figure. I'm not sure if there's any closer yards, but I know that I'm at the edge of my so-called territory, which I typically run. So I just have to be vigilant on making sure what is going on here hasn't been influenced on what's going on out there because bees will mingle two miles you get yards closer in a mile then it becomes a lot more troublesome one two three four five so I have five mites in this wash this has been randomly uh, surveyed through this yard, so I've pulled from about 10 hives. I'll have roughly 100 150 bees. So I'm looking at levels that are, you know, at that threshold to above that threshold mark, which has got me concerned. So I have to act on managing the mite loads within this yard. So I'm thinking. Uh, because it's on the edge of my apiary, uh, because I'm not sure what's going on in the surrounding yards, that, and I'm finding an abnormally high level of mites in this yard, as compared to everything else I'm, I have in my uh, apiary, uh, that I have to take serious attention to the varroa mites in this yard. So I'm going to not wait until the oxalic acid later on fall when these guys have hatched out. These guys are still brooding. Um, so I have to act in a different manner, which is Apivar. I'm going to be putting strips in this yard, uh, if not this afternoon, or tomorrow. We might actually come back this afternoon. So we come right back with strips. We're going to drop into these colonies. Uh, we did some washes and we're looking at about uh, five and a half, six percent mite counts in this yard. So I have Carrie working behind with strips. 
and we're just putting two per colony. These are apivar strips. I'm working ahead, flipping the pails off and opening the lids, and then I'm going to come back behind and uh, close up these colonies. So it should be pretty quick work. So it's not good that we found a high mite count, but it in a way is a little bit reassuring because of all the yards we've gone through, um, shaking bees from practically every yard, not finding any mites, you start to question whether or not your uh, monitoring uh, procedure is actually working. And obviously it is because we come to a yard that uh, has a, a level of mites and our testing showed just as it's supposed to. So we, act, we react and act. So after an extremely dry, hot summer, we get about six, five and a half, six inches of rain dumped on us over the last couple of weeks, which has caused a little bit of trouble for us getting into our bee yards. So I'm trying to make a round with these hives filling in dead spots. And I'm not, I'm having pretty tough luck today. So I got in, but, uh, it's just too soft. This truck is pretty heavy in the front end. She just dropped down. So a little bit of walking and thanks to our farm tractor, we'll be pulling out. I just hate making ruts going into bee yards because you know, now they are formed and now they will fill with water. And now I'm gonna have trouble pulling those guys out unless it dries the hell up or the ground freezes. So at any rate, at least it's our pasture and I'm not running up other people's property. And it just makes a little bit more of a chore. Ninety-five pounds. Do 
So this is the yard that we had to treat with Apivar because there was a higher mite count in this yard. It's one of the yards on the outside of my apiary, probably close to a neighbor or something. I've been doing washes over the whole day today and yesterday just to double check, triple check on the, uh, the mite loads as this winter nest emerges. <clears throat> and I'm not finding anything. This yard we treated with Apivar and I just want to see if uh, it's helped. Finding any, I'll just shake it for a bit longer now. Remember when we put the apivar in? When was that? That's before all the weather, eh? Yeah. So it's been at least three weeks. Two, two weeks. I'll have to check back in the vlog. Because I'm not finding any. Which has to mean it work it works, right? So there's no mites. So there's this apivar's treatment's been in here for two and a half, maybe three weeks. I'll have to look back at my records. And we put the treatment in, and there was there was like for sure over five percent mite infestation. So the apivar worked pretty quick for me, probably because there isn't a whole lot of brood inside, and the nests are starting to get smaller. So the uh, the mites really have no place to hide. So it's cold as f out here today. We're just dropping a little bit of syrup. And I want to show you why we're putting a little bit extra syrup on these colonies. They're pretty much to wait right now. But uh, as you can hear, the wind is just brutal. <coughs> it feels like snow, and I think that's what's coming. So I'm just going to tip some collar. I'm getting carried to keep tip some colonies back and I'll show you why we're putting a lot of attention on topping them up. So these bees are feeding on the syrup still. It's two degrees. Hungry, hungry. Filling their tummies. So we're just about through the apiary now, just you know, satisfying them, but giving them whatever they need. Oh, there, I should have my veil on too. Buggers. It's a box of bees. It's October 11th, and we have fallen into this terrific early winter storm. I don't remember a storm ever hitting us this severely this early before. All the conditions kind of lined up. Uh, we were over at the cattle farm trying to feed the cattle and the whole feedlot is saturated and now it has a foot and a half of snow over top. Three foot banks all across the yard. 
It's just a complete gong show. We can't get the tractors through because we're getting stuck. The cattle are hungry, but they're kind of just standing there in the weather on weighted out mode. We can't even get down the damn road with the tractor because it's so so heavy. The snow's so heavy, just we can't keep the wheels on. The, we can't keep the tractor on the road. It's just absolutely crazy. Most of our animals are out in pasture right now, so hopefully they've found shelter and hunkered down. And my hives. I'm kind of concerned a little bit about my hives being buried in the snow. <clears throat> but I rest assured that these colonies are strong and maybe getting covered over with snow is maybe a good thing just to keep them out of this terrible wind. It's 80 click winds today and it's blowing around these ice pellets. It's almost like you're getting sandblasted all morning. It's just absolutely ridiculous. So once I can travel the roads, I'll have to uh, get out and just take a peek to see how the colonies are doing. I don't want them to suffocate, but I'm certain that they're warm enough that they will be able to, uh, you know, melt the entrance and, you know, not ice up. Um, it's not so much the snow cover, but it's the ice up around the hives that I'm concerned about and they'll suffocate. Because one disadvantage of what I do with my honey operation is I will have that pliable inner cover and I have that sealed top so I don't have any sort of ventilation or access out that top. I do that very purposely to help manage terrible winds like this and just to help increase the moisture within the colony as I bring them inside. But uh, when they're outside and the entrances get iced over, you know, it causes a little bit of a, a risk, a bit of a concern. So I'll just have to wait out the storm and then head out to the yards and see what's up. Rest assured they're strong, so they should be able to manage themselves. So this yard is fairly exposed. Yeah, see the ice? But look at that. You can almost feel the warmth coming out of those colonies. See the ice there? Look at that. These guys aren't going to suffocate. Nice little end, end access here. Rest assured, these colonies are big. And big colonies will look after themselves. Yeah, see, there's that warmth has melted the fronts of the entrances. Actually, hear some bees flying in here. That's absolutely ridiculous. Look at that. So, in a way, this ice up in front here kind of protected the entrance from that brutal wind. The girls are buried here. See little caverns. Look at that. Little caverns. See the, the hives have melted space all the way around the colonies. So they're buried in snow, but there's open space all the way around them. And here's the entrance here. Isn't that cool? The warmth off the colonies. Look at the, look at that. The sheer warmth off the colony has melted the snow all the way around the colony. There's no fear of these guys suffocating. Not what's, whatsoever. These pails are tapping somewhat empty because they're feeding. It's not something. a heck of a lot easier feeding these hives in the fall than it is you know trying to feed them late winter while they're in winter mode so a heck of a lot less stressful getting the syrup down into these colonies now than trying to get it into them if this pail is empty 
Look at that little cavern. Is that ever cool? These colonies underneath the snow probably didn't know any different the storm hit. So I'm out just checking bee yards this afternoon just to check up on my babies to see how they're doing. This is one of my more exposed yards. I have I was unable to get this yard out because well the rains came three weeks ago and as I'm unable to access this yard so I couldn't move them out. As you can see they're quite exposed except for this little bluff of trees here which kind of caught a bit of snow, which helped. A lot of the yard is buried, which would have protected these colonies, the clusters from that brutal wind that came with that snowstorm. Some of the colonies over there, not so much in the wide open, and my entrances weren't reduced enough. So I was a little concerned about the wind blowing on the clusters there, but by the looks of it, uh, the hives had nicely iced over. So I, I'm thinking the ice probably protect the clusters from that wind. Starting to melt now, it won't take long to melt this snow. They're talking 12s, uh, like as far as out, out as I can see. So the snow is gonna disappear. Hopefully the water will run away and, you know, get rid of this white stuff. I don't expect the land to firm up any. We're getting kind of late in the season for that. But if anything, if we can get rid of the snow, and then maybe that frost will come in as November approaches. That's about our only hope. So if we get a little bit of frost set in, I'll be able to walk into these yards and pick them up quite easy. And I'll just, uh, just hope that the next snowfall stays away until we're able to get more of our work done here. Nice and cozy down there. Nicely melted caverns. So these guys would have been protected from the wind. Not a problem about that. These little caverns. These guys that were more exposed, you can see I didn't have the entrances reduced. Kind of got caught off guard there a bit. So the wind would have come in from that direction. Right across the yard like that. So these guys, their entrances wide open. Those clusters are right there. Unaffected, no bees, no dead bees or nothing. So this is what I'm assuming happened. The uh, the hives probably got iced over just like this and that would have protected the clusters from that wind now that's melting away. You can hear them just humming inside. Sounding quite content. like little caves. I woke these guys up.
The sun has made its appearance again, so I've been able to shake the toque and put my hat back on. So it's supposed to get up around 12 degrees today, so hopefully that sheds this blanket. It's been frustrating just having this wet blanket just keep everything sopping wet and soggy over the last few days. It's taken forever to disappear. But the streams, all these little tributaries, all the little watersheds in the countryside are full. We've, we're shedding more water right now than we have in the last two springs. So it's quite, uh, it's good. We're getting a little bit of recharge in the groundwater. It's good for the pastures, good for the dugouts, all the aquifers and such. We need, we need this shot of moisture, but it's coming at the wrong time. I mean, we got to get this crop off. So hopefully we get a few nice days here. Shed this blanket, maybe dry the ground up a bit so we can at least travel. I don't know. Either that or just get rid of the snow so at least when it freezes we can walk on frost. Not have to deal with this relentless mud. But we've been able to access the bee yards again. We're in the half ton so we can travel a little bit further in than we can with the bee trucks. And we have the oxalic acid going again. so. We're going to make a round with oxalic acid. We're putting two to three grams in per hive. Uh, it's going to be Carrie's job for the next few days. We found ever since we started using oxalic, it just seems to... You know, it's that extra hammer. It's like hitting those mites again with something completely different. We treat with Vapivar in the spring. And we found ever since we've been treating with oxalic vapor late in the fall, that it's, it's been helping... Uh, maintain that effectiveness of the apivar in the spring. So I'm not sure what's going on, but uh, we're just treating this late oxalic as a bit of a mop-up. So yeah, we're hitting the mites in two different mediums, which is, which is you know, what we're supposed to do as best management practices. So I'll show you what Carrie's doing here. Uh, we're treating with the uh, ProVap 110. We like this little device. It's a little bit slower, but it administers exactly what we want. We want two to three grams in per hive and it's ministering at, at precisely the temperature that we want. So it's very controlled. And because of that, it takes, you know, another 20 seconds or so per hive. But uh, I mean, this time of year, you just keep working, right? So two or three days, we should get through the whole apiary. And then I got to start thinking about getting the winter shed ready and start moving these babies in. The bees don't like it. protection on. You can see all the vapor escaping the cracks here. So we, what we want is the vapor penetrating the cluster. As you can see, it's nicely penetrating. So we're getting that nice fine dust throughout the entire cluster. And that fine dust is covering all the bees and targeting the mites. Now that there's no brood, those mites can't get away. This is working just beautifully. So I'm consolidating hives into dead spots. As you can see, now Kerry's caught up, he's waiting for me. <laughs> but I'm having a little bit of trouble because these clusters are so big. And when I pull these boxes off the bottom board, you know, the cluster is down to the bottom board and I'm leaving bees pain the ass, but it is what it is. So I got to tap the bees on the bottom board. Anyways, I better hurry up because Carrie needs to keep going here. Now I'm going to move this colony into place and she's going to keep treating.
creating the cluster very nice. Was it five degrees right now? All the bees are back home. The hives aren't really clustered up too much. Here's a box with a lot of leaks in it. Well, I, yeah, I just moved this hive in to a dead spot, so it's not sealed with propolis at all. No seals on that one. Hungry, hungry. at 230 and it's sublimating at 220 and dropping so when the uh, oxalic hits the heat pool it starts uh, sublimating and it's dropping the temperature pretty much immediately pretty much when she sees the temperature start to rebound a bit when all the treatment's done it doesn't take much time at all maintaining the temperature though that looks good get on this side of the wind. We've wrapped the bowl in a bit of a, it's like a muffler wrap just to help maintain the temperature in that bowl so we don't get as much rebound. I can't hear a word you're saying. <laughs> so I'm just heading out this morning to go pick up the bee yard. Dad was out driving around with the tractor checking uh, pasture fences early th this morning because that's what dads do best is they get up really early and they go do stuff so he drove up to one of our pastures and I checked in one of my bee yards and the bee yard is in a little bit of a low spot I can't get at it and now with all the snow and this melt and not only the melt but the slow melt everything is starting to run off the land but the waterways are plugged full of snow still so it's backing up water right across the pasture one of our pastures is right under water got to move the cattle off that one shortly but it's uh creeping up to one of my bee yards so it's going to end up uh, the bee yard will be underwater this afternoon so we're just heading out with the bee truck and I'm gonna pick the uh, the yard out but I won't be able to get in there without getting stuck so dad has the tractor and he's gonna hopefully not have to pull me in and pull me out but if needs be at least he'll be there with the tractor to help me out what a treat so we are about to venture in here with the bee truck and the tractor and I'm gonna pull these colonies out of the water. See the pallets have them off the ground. So these clusters will be up in the box. So there won't be any losses here. It's nothing like putting a bee yard in the bottom of a floodplain. Our pasture extends right far back. This is what our entire pasture here looks like now. The cattle are kind of marooned on some high ground. So they are gonna be pulled out today. But first my bees.
Nothing is easy. You'd think this would be the wettest part. Nope. High ground. Let's see if we can get out of here. Might have to get the four wheel drive tractor.
I was going to drop them off in another bee yard, but everything's so bloody wet. And I didn't feel like getting stuck again. So I figured, well, hell, we're close enough to bringing these hives in. Might as well just bring them up to the loading pad here and drop them off. And these will be the first ones in. At any rate, these guys are going to live here. I'm going to take the pails that I took off the, uh, the yard because they're still feeding on them. And I'm going to put them on and just let them, you know, maybe redirect their attention to the syrup and just get settled in, in the yard here. At any rate, that's it for that little adventure. Just a little bit disorientated, a little bit confused. And feeding. So hopefully they can find their place and get back to their home and just kind of settle in and maybe take down some syrup and just pretend none of that happened. My entire apiary has just all of a sudden taken flight. It's 12 degrees and we have a little bit of sun and it's been a few days since we have had some flight weather so these bees have, you know, they're out and flying. And it's almost like they know what's coming. The forecast is telling us we're about to drop straight into winter here, which I'm looking forward to freeze up all these ruts and then we can bring that crawler in and just flatten everything. Travel the field so we can get the crop off. But these hives, it's almost like they're, they know this is one of their last opportunities and they're not on any type of foraging flight. They're just on the maintenance flights as you, you know, as they go out, almost like an orientation flight. Probably taking their last stretch of their wings, maybe a little void. Maybe they know this is the last time they can fly in the next five and a half months. So just stretching their wings and just, you know, getting ready. And I kind of enjoy this sound. Kind of savor it because it will be probably another five and a half months till I hear it. It's the sound of healthy bees. Guys are wet. This is the yard that I uh, <clears throat> picked out of the water and get these entrances off. I put the entrances on just to give them a proper treatment. Oh, look at that. The comb got wet to the bottom of the comb and it's draining. So I gotta dry these guys out. They'll dry out in the shed here. I just gotta give them a little more ventilation.
I'll get Carrie to do that first thing tomorrow morning. Out picking beehives this morning. We are moving hives inside now. The apiary is nicely froze, so we won't be getting, well, I won't say we're not going to get stuck, but at least we can travel into the yards. The ground's really firmed up. We've had a hard freeze, so in one way, I'm cursing the fact that winter is coming, as I've been cursing it for the last two weeks, three weeks, but this hard freeze is great because now we can travel, we're not dealing with mud or ruts, and I can get these hives, pick them up and move them indoors. The only challenge I'm gonna have now is that because these hives were sitting on wet ground, they're going to be froze probably to the sod, especially the yards that uh, have been sitting in the same spot for the entire season. They really get themselves worked down into the soil so I'm anticipating we're gonna to have to pry some of these up and just scrape the runners out underneath but as far as I'm considered that is just a detail these hives are in terrific shape they look fantastic the clusters or these winter clusters are very well set up and their winter nest is very well defined so I'm extremely happy about that just putting a little bit extra work into moving these girls in is just uh, just a detail as long as they don't get stuck Minus 18 out here this morning, and I'm thinking just, what the hell? I think I remember making a video just a little while ago uh, predicting a nice, warm, and mild November. More of a hope than anything, I think. So it looks like November is coming in extremely cold here. We're, look we're looking at minus 20s for overnight lows on the weekend. So I better get these girls in. It's time to get them in. And this is what uh, I get for pushing this work right to the very end. But you know, whatever, these bees can handle it. My bees aren't made of sugar. My bees are made by Carrie and she isn't made of sugar either. She's developing queens that pretty much, you know, flip the bird to mother nature and to my management. Just, you know, screw you beekeeper. We're gonna keep going here. Truck says minus 15 now. My arm's cold. My drill is cold. You know, the bees are cold. Better get in there before they get chilled. <clears throat> my toes are cold. My fingers are cold. It's just going to be a cold type of day today, I think. I'm prying these hives off the ground, and there's mud underneath. I mean, when I moved the truck here, I just about fell through. Just got to be careful. I don't want to fall through the frost because that's that's not good news.
Today is take your son to work day. So I'm gonna be taking my oldest son, Michael, who is prepared for work already, to uh, come and we're gonna go pick some beehives out of the yards. Uh, we're going to get him suited up. I got this new bee suit straight from New Zealand. It will make its farm de debut. Comes out of Cell. So we're going to get Michael suited up in this because he's going to be the guy operating the cradle. And there shouldn't be too much bee activity, but uh, there might be a few bees fly out from the entrance and I don't want to get my new bee stung in the face. So we're going to, Michael's going to get dressed up in this. Let's just try it on for size. Michael is 15. 14. You're 14? Oh, Michael's 14. All oh, right, you're going to be 15 next year because He's looking for a job. We are going to get going. The truck is warming up. It's minus 11 out right now. It's supposed to warm up to minus three, so it should be a good day to move bees. We'll just get some coffee going here. Number one job on the farm. First thing in the morning. Carrie, I've got her locked away in the extracting room, busy doing a whole bunch of projects. Cleaning pails. You know, cleaning up wax. We have excluders we gotta melt out and escapes we gotta repair. So it's gonna be a nice and busy day in the honey house. And we are gonna head out and pick some bees. First mistake on the job site is you didn't what? put honey in your coffee. Oh. Honey. My goodness. Here's some honey here. This place is a little bit of a mess as you can see. Second job of the day is I'm going to get Michael to clean this room up. It's looking like a fall time honey house. Don't be like your mother and use sugar. You use, you use honey. Sometimes it's the coffee that keeps you going. That's that little bit of pleasure in a day that really sucks. And you're like, well, at least I got my coffee. Trying to get four yards put in this morning. And then another four this afternoon. As I chip away at this job, nice to have some help run the arm so that I can chip these hives out. So it's making for pretty quick work. The hives aren't bothering us too much, so you don't really need your bail too much. It's pretty cold today. Just the one hive was kind of flying out guys. So they're pretty settled in. It's nice to pick the yards up. I'm picking the yards up in all the uh, prime hunting yards because uh, rifle season starts on the 11th. So I want to get all those yards picked up so we don't fall upon the line of fire. I don't like getting in hunter's ways because they're, they're busy doing their thing. I just want to get the hives out. Without any disturbance or fights.
K we're gonna go take some beehive stacks off the truck and we're not gonna spill them we'll do a big wide turn and come in square without running over things okay lift your forks up a bit find your brake right You know where your brake is? Yeah. Okay, I'm going very slowly. Put it down just a hair. There you go, that's good. All the way in. Not that way, yeah. You bring it, let the load down. Looks like I need a paint job on these boxes. Slowly, yeah, that's good. Now I'll come find a place for them. Okay, side shift it over a bit. Alrighty, go grab another one. That well, looks like my boy has his first bee spill. I wasn't quite watching and I think there's one of the forks cooked wrong. But they just fell down and it's a cold day. It's minus five yet. But they seem to be walking themselves back into the cluster here. Just marching themselves in. So this one is already marched in. We put it back on the pallet. We'll give this one, I don't know, another two minutes. These ones have gathered off the bottom. And this one we're just giving a little bit of time just to recoup itself. How's it feel to dump a load of bees onto the cement pad? Say we should let you do this. <laughs> you want me to clean it up? <laughs> yeah, I can do that. This end's called? The smart end. Smart end. <laughs> and you know what this end's called? The stupid end. The stupid end. Because it takes a little more brains to know how to work this end than this end. <laughs> so you throw over your hook, you know what you do first? Say heads up. Yeah, you always yell heads up. Just in case there's somebody standing on the other side so they don't get a hook in the head. Heads up! Okay, can you go put that? Now, to tie it up, my box builder taught me this. Quickly wrap it up like this. And then to tighten it up, just go in and around itself. And it will never come undone. If you, this will be something you learned today, you can tell your teacher. Gotta learn, Gotta learn something. Perfect. And that can just hang there. 
and not cause any trouble or you can tuck it in and completely start your way and that will never cause you any issues down the highway. So now you learned something. Yep. So as I'm picking my hives, I'm just, you know, some of these yards, I didn't get a chance to get around to filling in the dead spots. So I have to consolidate the pallets. This yard is particularly bad. One, two, three. Four, five pallets of empty. So out of this yard, we had about 10. So that's 20 percent, 25 percent summer loss in this yard. So that's a lot. Sure adds up. But I'd make a pretty tough full call because I, I don't want you know poor hives going into winter. There's no use investing any type of money into these colonies in the fall or waste their time bringing them in, bringing them in to the winter shed to take up space. And then just the act of moving them is just. Why are we moving these hives that are not viable? So I do a lot. Uh, I have all these little cues I use to be able to screen out all the poor doing hives. And my objective is, you know, if I put 100 hives in, I want 100 hives out. And, you know, as the years go by, I seem to get closer to that because I'm able to identify these poor hives in the fall that uh, obviously aren't gonna make it through the winter. So it's important that I take this fall call. And I mean, if I would have had my act together this fall, I would have had these empty spots filled in with nukes that are produced through the summer. I have a yard sitting there waiting to be put into these dead spots, but that yard will just be put into the winter shed now. And by doing that, I am actively like taking out those poor colonies, the colonies that will likely not make winter, show a little more risk and I'm replacing them with these brilliant young hives. So just that act of continual uh, refresh, continual uh, replacement 
and just uh, rejuvenizing the uh, the apiary. It's just one of the strategies I use. So I'm not as hard bent to uh, to shake out these colonies in the fall or through the summer that are just not showing me any promise. So I just want to show you one of the high bottoms here. As I was moving these colonies and consolidating them, I'm um, just looking at the bottom board and just to see what it looks like underneath. You can sometimes tell a lot of what's going on within that colony just by looking at what drops from it. These guys have been treated with Apivar in the spring and I didn't treat them with anything in the fall except for late fall here we gave them an oxalic acid vapor treatment of two to three grams per single box and that was about two weeks ago or something like that I'll have to check but the highs were completely broodless and the reason why I do that is I'll show you why I do it so here's a colony that I moved over there you can see the size of the cluster is a fairly sizable cluster but they're all nicely tucked up to the frame, so I didn't lose any bees when I moved them. That's one of the disadvantages of these bottom boards like this, is I, to consolidate I have to actually actively, it's almost like opening up the hive, because this is the bottom board. At any rate, take a close look here. This bottom board is just littered with mites. I started counting them, but I, you know, I got up over a hundred, so I quit counting because I'm wasting my time, but... And here's that oxalic acid residue here. And you can see the oxalic acid residue here, too. So that oxalic acid, I'm framing this mite drop to the oxalic acid vapor treatment. So what I'm trying to achieve with my oxalic acid vapor treatment is uh, just to hit them with another hammer. I, uh, I treat my hives early spring with Apivar and then I monitor to see if I'll need to uh, treat in the fall again. And if I can get away with it, if my uh, counts are low enough, I can get away with it. I'll, I won't treat in the fall and I'll wait until late October when these hives are practically completely broodless and I'll hit them with an oxalic acid vapor treatment and as you can see on that bottom board uh, if there's any mites any uh, mites within the colony it knocks them right down so I think it's adding a little bit of efficacy to uh, my treatment plan I'm able to hit it I'm able to hit the mites with a secondary treatment completely different from the first um, I'm able to, you know, maybe maybe this is helping extend the efficacy of the Apivar as we're hearing uh, everybody saying that it's becoming less effective now. You, you hit them multiple times, many times, multiple times of different things, and that's supposedly is going to extend the eff effectiveness of all the treatments you got available. So it's just, a, you know, another strategy, and it seems to be working for me. One thing about these bloody winters, I mean, I curse this snow, but it provides northern beekeepers here with a little bit of reprieve from that continual mite regeneration. 
about five months, I'd say. Our hives go into winter where they're broodless now and they practically stay broodless right till we set them out. There's a little bit of brooding going on through the winter, but these hives pretty much shut down for half the year. And that provides us with an opportunity to, you know, target these mites because they're fully exposed, they can't hide within the cappings. So we can take the opportunity of winter, is very, very seldom you'll ever hear me say, taking the opportunity of winter. But here's our situation and we can take advantage of this situation by uh, having these hives go broodless, having all these mites exposed where they can't hide and just hammer them, kill those little bastards. And then the treatment next spring, if there's any mist, maybe that'll get them. The treatment in the spring is gonna help uh, you know, relieve the hives of maybe some of the mite inflow from other yards around and get through summer, get through fall without any mites or very low mite counts, produce that very substantial, healthy winter nest, and then come fall again as these hives go broodless, just mop up anything that's in those hives. So it's an interesting little strategy. I've been doing it for a number of years now and it seems to be working. So the old saying is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I'll just keep riding this wave until, until it doesn't work. But for now, I'm killing all those little bastards and my hives are showing benefit from it. This is the yard that we treated with Apivar this fall. The only yard that we had treated with Apivar. And it worked. Our last count showed virtually no mites. So the uh, treatment was very effective. Just we kind of forgot about this yard and just realized yet these strips are still in here. So we picked a nice warm day. What is it, minus seven right now, Carrie? These bees are, you know, not tight cluster, but clustered up. And we're trying to pull these strips out. But it doesn't seem like you're having too much trouble. I'm not too crazy on leaving these strips on through the winter. Just in the very act of due diligence and responsible use of treatments. So we're actually, we're pulling out quite easy. Even got stung, eh? Over there I got stung in the face. So. Okay, so Carrie did get stung. <laughs> That's why the veil's on. bees otherwise well we use a bit of smoke on them as long as we don't murder the queen pulling these out so I was extremely happy with uh, how effective this treatment was we're counting what was it five percent mite counts so then we dropped in these strips we we'll come back in a few weeks and we couldn't find any mites And these clusters look good, so that should help them get through winter. This is a job that really should be done when the bees are loosely clustered. It makes it much more pleasant for everybody. But you know, that's just the way this fall has been. So Carrie's taking the strips out ahead of me and I am loading these hives up onto the truck. And we're going straight into the shed.
Holy moly, I'm just chilled to the bone. It is a cold day today. It's actually not that cold. It's only about minus seven or so. But uh, it's breezy. There's no sun. And it's damp. Like it's, it was snowing this morning. So we have a low pressure system coming through. And I'm just chilled to the bone. I'm on my third last yard to move these hives in. I should be able to get done by supper, which is going to be really nice because we have some cold weather coming at us. You can probably hear the breeze coming through. It's, it's a terrible breeze. At any rate, I just wanted to show you uh, one thing that I do with my colonies. is probably one of the most asked questions I get about uh, my colony management and is that bubble wrap. I call them foamies. And I use this stuff basically exactly for probably this, you know, this wind, you're probably hearing this wind, exactly for this wind, just for the breeze. I buy it at the local hardware store. We use it to wrap hot water tanks. You know, it's just a, it's just two layers of, of bubble, bubble wrap with aluminum foil on one side or two sides. We use it to wrap our hot water tanks to conserve heat or they use it for I don't know what else I use it for, but they I use it for these foamies just to help seal the lid up on top of the colony. So what I do is I use these pliable covers. And all they are is bubble wrap. I use as inner covers on my colonies. So on the lids I have this rim, as you can see. And this rim's to provide space for the patty, but what it also does is it it presses down this foamy around the edges of the box. Just so when I open up the colonies, I put my foamy down, it uh, and the lid back on, it just creates a complete seal to the top of that colony. And as you can see, after a while, the bees will propylize it down and make a complete seal. And that just helps eliminate all that kind of draft that gets into the colony whenever we crack the lid. Because without that, we have these gaps, these spaces here that uh, just create an unwanted draft. This time of year, these clusters, they're broodless. So they can take a lot more abuse. So, you know, a little bit of bone chilling draft blowing onto the cluster is not as detrimental to them. But in the spring, when they're maintaining a brood nest, they have all these conditions they have to maintain. They have to maintain humidity and uh, temperature and just the resources of food around that and by having a cold blast cold draft blowing into the top of the colony after I go through and work with them it just adds stress it doesn't do them any good so basically I use these they're mostly for the spring just to kind of protect that cluster the integrity of that cluster throughout as it's starting to develop itself into into spring like these guys, they don't know any different. It's like a cold day and windy and uh, they don't know any different from the draft hitting these colonies. They got a wall propolized up around the bottoms. You know, that foamy around the top is well sealed. Uh, they're nice, neat and tight and tidy inside. I don't really have to worry about um, moisture issues through the winter. So I bring them inside and that cold, dry air drawn into the building, you know, really dries the building out. So I am, in, in fact, looking to maintain a little bit of condensation type humidity within that cluster. So sealing off the top does that very effectively. While I was wintering outside, I had to be very conscious on removing the heat and humidity from that cluster. Uh, what happens is that heat rises, humidity, and you want to be able to allow it to escape to be able to get that humidity out. Otherwise, that humidity will rise up and condense and rain on the cluster, otherwise, or it'll freeze. It's a bit of an ice crust, and as it warms, then it'll rain, and it doesn't do them any good. So if you're going to be using any type of inner covers like this, wintering outside, especially in wet, humid areas, 
just be sure to um, pay a lot of attention to allowing that warm, humid air off the cluster to escape. It's just, just what I believe. I know there's a little bit of debate about that, but you don't want condensation within the cluster, within the cavity, to uh, negative, negatively affect that cluster. So just keep that in mind as you're watching me do all this kind of stuff. So I'll just turn the light on here before I shut it off for the winter.
there she is. Everybody's inside. I spaced things a little tighter this year just so I could fit everything in. Boy, it feels good to be done. So I'm going to do the thing that I look forward to every year. Lights off. Turn the fans off. Turn the ceiling fans off too. So every year when I get these bees in, I look forward to the moment of standing inside this shed with 30 to 40 million bees in complete Silence. Just to hear that roar. I'm not sure if the mic picks this up. This is one of the moments that uh, keeps me going. Just savor it.